A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you will not serve my God, or worship the golden statue that I set up? Be ready now to fall down and worship the statue I had made. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, flute, lyre, harp, psaltery, bagpipe, and all the other musical instruments. Otherwise, you shall be instantly cast into the white hot furnace. And who is the God who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, There is no need for us to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, can save us from the white hot furnace, and from your hands, O king, may he save us. But even if he will not, know, O king, that we will not serve your God, or worship the golden statue that you set up. King Nebuchadnezzar's face became livid with utter rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times more than usual, and had some of the strongest men in his army find it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the white hot furnace. Nebuchadnezzar rose in haste and asked his nobles, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Assertedly, O king, they answered. But he replied, I see four men unfettered and unhurt, walking in the fire, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel to deliver the servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the royal command and yielded their bodies rather than, rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Verbum Domini Glory and praise forever. Glory and praise forever. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our fathers, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. And blessed is your holy and glorious name, praiseworthy and exalted above all for all ages. Glory and praise forever. Blessed are you in the temple of your holy glory, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Glory. Blessed are you on the throne of your kingdom, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Blessed are you who look into the depths from your throne upon the cherubim, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Blessed are you in the firmament of heaven, praiseworthy and glorious forever. Dominus Fobiscum, et cum spiritu tuum, Lexius Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Gloria Tibi Domine. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. 
How can you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Amen, amen, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if the son frees you, then you will truly be free. I know that you are the descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no room among you. I tell you what I have seen in the Father's presence. Then do what you have heard from the Father. They answered and said to him, Our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father. So they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and am here. I did not come on my own but he sent me. Verbum Domini Lasti Pi Christe Very powerful words in the gospel today. And we see this will be building up as the time of Lent reaches its climax and comes into Palm Sunday. But we'll get to that tomorrow. I want to look a little bit at the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is one of the most intriguing of all the books of the Old Testament. And depending upon which Bible you pick up, you will find the contents of the book of Daniel in one or two places. Our responsorial psalm today was a prayer, and we'll see that that was written later because an earlier writing in Hebrew and Aramaic relates a series of heroic valor, that was the reading itself, which supplies the captive Jews which needed courage and loyalty in a difficult time for them when they were displaced from Israel in the Babylonian captivity. Their whole nation was challenged by forced pagan idolatry. Sometime later, another author created several magnificent prayers effectively embellishing the extract of the first reading today. They were prayers of grief and pleading on one hand, that's the prayer of Ananias, which we didn't hear today, recognizing their exile as due punishment for abandoning the law of God back in Israel. And a second reading, which, or second prayer rather, which came from that, uh, was extracted in the first uh, the responsorial psalm today and is given on Sundays, praising God in all parts of nature, sung by the three men in today's story, while flames were flying all around them. We know this as the canticle of the three young men, found, as we heard, in the responsorial psalm, as well as Sunday mornings. Blessed be the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise and exalt him forever and ever. And it goes on. It stands on its own as a poem of splendor, magnifying the Lord in the elements of sun and moon and ice and snow and rivers, mountains, old men and boys, young maidens and so forth, all praising God. In fact, St. Francis of Assisi was influenced by it in his familiar Canticle of the Sun. And in the Catholic Bible, the two added prayers are inserted in the story line right at the point of today's reading. As such, they would greatly enhance the sacred drama, rising above fear to praise of God under the mantle of trust in him. Now, the Jewish leaders went about determining which books early on that were to be accepted in their Bible. It was about the beginning of the second century. And one criterion then was that the text had to be located in Hebrew since many of the original Hebrew manuscripts were lost and only translated ones in Greek remained, this was the case of several books such as Maccabees 1 and 2, Esther, Ruth, and Esdras, beautiful stories. Protestant and Hebrew renderings of the book of Daniel 
Displace, therefore, the two prayers mentioned outside of the book of Daniel as secondary, yet revered. Eastern Orthodox and Catholic Bibles admit them with equal acceptance, and thus it depends on which Bible you pick up, whether the prayers are separate from the book or inserted as they would be in these readings. Well, pinpointing the story itself, it is about a Jew, Daniel, who lived at the time of the forced deportation of the Jews to the Babylonian captivity or exile, five and a half centuries before Christ. The book is written much later, however. The name Daniel means God is truth. We saw that in the gospel, the whole message of truth that Jesus is speaking with. And that is what rings forth throughout this entire book, truth and loyalty, and the gift of wisdom and courage carving out a powerful storyline for people to dwell on and be edified by. And since these are most likely allegories, more like an every man's story, the personification of a nation rather than an individual, they impart a stirring moral message of great significance to the reader, even today's reader, when we hear the valor of these men who are willing to die regardless of what their God will do for them. The book of Daniel was surely a constant companion of consolation, not just in the Babylonian exile for these people who had been displaced, but in the dispersion that followed after Jerusalem was leveled and Israel ceased to exist, something which, remember, Jesus predicted. The first part deals with Daniel as a young lad among his friends named Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, trained in the court of the king. Now, those names we didn't hear today. Their names were changed, but the Hebrew names originally were those. Hananiah means God is gracious. Mishael means God provides. And Azariah, that prayer that we didn't say today, but was also a beautiful part of this, uh, this reading, this uh, book, God has helped. All three of those are so appropriate, graciousness, provision, and help that fit right into the pattern of what took place today in that reading, namely their being saved from the, uh, the uh, furnace. All three denote specific power and grace, power from God alone, nothing more needed, nothing less expected. It is that sort of trust that stamps the entire first part of the book. However, in today's readings, the author has them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abnegigo. And Daniel himself is given the name Belteshazzar. Why? Well, these are actually the Babylonian names that were given to them to obliterate the memory and the power of the Hebrew God in the court of the tyrannical king Nebuchadnezzar. For in the name was power, and to remove that name and substitute it for something else would be a disaster. Some commentators say that these adopted names alluded to slaves of the Babylonian deities. The substitution from Hebrew to Babylon, therefore, is crucial here, for it indicates a demonic sort of thing to the Hebrew reader. These men were positioned, therefore, as stewards to false idols, which they would not succumb. Even so, there arises a faction who try to denounce not Daniel, but his friends sharing in the governance of the province. The king had already rewarded Daniel for interpreting a dream that he had, that famous dream where he didn't know the statue of clay and all the rest of that, which we see not in this particular reading, but it precedes it. And so they were jealous of the fact that he was rewarded for being able to interpret the dream, and they tried to trip him up and others and so that is what we are seeing today. We come upon that today because they were adhering to Hebrew ways and worship rather than succumbing to what Nebuchadnezzar had ordered, ordained. So what is the author trying to convey here? Mixed in these youths is wisdom, assurance, and a stature of greatness, even in their modest, humble demeanor. Israel was a small nation, now reduced basically to being a slave of Babylon. The temple was gone, the kosher foods and laws were forbidden, and as far as we know, many suffered death rather than disobey the commands as demanded in the Torah. 
But at the same time, the pagan culture was making all sorts of efforts to reduce the memory of the Jews to nothing. We already saw that in the change of the names. To infiltrate their education and to annihilate any trace of prayer and temple. As in the later Roman times, enormous statues were built to venerate gods of various natural forces, the sun, the moon, and now a statue giving divinity to the king himself. We familiar with the Colosseum in Rome, that amphitheater which indeed bloody games were played, is one. But Roman martyrs were executed not so much there as in the nearby Circus Maximus for blood-curdling sport. Nearby, between the two, there was a 90-foot gilding statue of Nero, later set up at the juncture of the arena, where all intoxicated the afternoon bloodshed of that sports arena in their gladiatorial games would see the emperor's statue divinizing himself in blazing sunlight. Well, Nebuchadnezzar apparently beat him to the punch certainly centuries earlier. So the story tells us in Daniel with his own gilded statue. As to the response of the three young men, ominous threats would not condition their lives one iota. If our God, whom we serve, can save us from the white-hot furnace and from your hands, O King, may he save us. But even if he will not, know, O King, that we will not serve your God or worship the golden statue that you set up. Let us examine the valor and courage penetrating those words. These men were driven by something else, a fierce loyalty to the God of the covenant, who, though seemingly eclipsed more and more from the cultural scene in Babylon in which these men were immersed, nonetheless, they would be faithful to their covenant with God. Regardless of how he would respond in this instant, they would not bow to any other God, as horrible as their death was to be. And note, this was no suicide, no funeral pyre in the Ganges either. They prayed to be saved, of course, but that was secondary. The Hebrew Shema, acknowledging one God alone, still had its effect, and the author was stirring the hearts of his readers to maintain their loyalty and obedience to Yahweh in dark, foreboding, and punishing times. And these young men were saved, rewarded for their obedience and loyalty to God in whom they really trust. We will soon after Easter hear a similar reflection. Peter and John after Pentecost and the Acts of the Apostles will tell the leaders of the Jerusalem temple that they will not stop preaching and teaching about Jesus the Christ. Despite threats and subsequent beatings, they reply, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to obey you rather than God, you be the judges. It is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. My friends, we need not continue the glorious litany of the names of saints who met their martyrdom witnessing to Christ. Under no other name can we be saved. Among the first words uttered by Peter and the other leaders already under persecution right after Pentecost. Persecution, those followers of Christ would come to see, would be a logical outcome of loyalty in defense of truth. So they constantly prayed for strength, as did the other church members around them. And note that it was the religious leaders who were called first to witness. They held a certain joy and supreme confidence, which in turn baffled and even infuriated the status quo leadership of Rome. And yes, even much later in times like Elizabethan England, the French Revolution, the Third Reich, and Stalin and Mao Zedong's gulags, to name just some of the most familiar critical testing times in which the blood of the martyrs became, as St. Irenaeus says, Sir Tertullian said, the seed of the church blood of the martyrs becoming the seed of the church. Today, the attack on religion is horrific in Syria and in neighboring countries. We just learned a day or two ago that a Jesuit priest who spent 25 years in Syria was martyred, really, 
for the beautiful work that he was doing there, not just for Christians, but for Muslims as well. They were starving because of this horrendous war that's going on. And he begged for more things, and they simply came in in the front of this church. He was attacked, and he was shot through the head twice after being beaten by them. Suffering continues in China, Myanmar, and various attacks on Christians, especially Catholics are meted out under the scimitar of Islam, too horrific to describe here. The young men in the book of Daniel could have adopted to mere cultural changes, as could be said of all ages. That was not the issue. Offering incense, just a touch of it, was enough for Christians supposedly at least to be exempt from the scourge or the ax, the torch, or the lion's tooth under Caesar. But even that bit of incense would still violate the acknowledgement of one God and his son. Under no other name can we be saved. My friends, today in the United States there is an attack against religion and it is not always that subtle. Though it is in the little chipping away in the courts, in the workplace, in the schools, big time and often not directly attacking God, as was the case of the ancients against Jesus Christ, or in the case of Nebuchadnezzar against Yahweh in the Old Testament, but somewhat obliquely it is done. Today it is not a frontal attack, Nero the Colossus, the statue versus Jesus, but like the French Revolution's equality, fraternity, liberty as side swipes, as substitute statues, the enlightenment in place of the God-man, Jesus Christ, under no other name can anyone be saved. No, there is a God who saves, as Nebuchadnezzar and Caesar found out and eventually acknowledged, a God who wants to share his love but demands that we respond with loyalty in kind. If you love me, keep my commandments. My friends, they are not suggestions, they are commandments. It is in the area of the commandments as a direct sequence to acknowledging God as author of life and of everything that is good and being attacked. Now, how they should be observed, that is one thing. No, it's not about how they should be observed, it's as whether they exist or not, whether they have any relevance to 21st century civilization, especially America. Too sweeping a statement to make? One could go through each commandment and list official endorsed violations of all. Is God or the Supreme Court the arbiter of life? Taking the name of the Lord in vain? No, just dismissing Jesus' name from public places altogether. Schools, courts, and even the military being threatened today. Keeping holy the Lord's day? Traffic jams are not caused at churches on Sundays, but at malls and stadiums. Honor father and mother. Many states are sanctioning not just one of each, but two of one gender each. Thou shalt not kill. Planned Parenthood is up to 330,000 babies aborted. That means killed, friends. Every year with taxpayer funding. Adultery, fornication. Are these words even in the vocabulary or are they too offensive for the status quo of tolerance? Tolerance of sin is the mark of least compassion that one can imagine because it leaves festering what may lead another to eternal damnation. And religious freedom is being attacked under the HHS mandate, Health and Human Service mandate, which has generated some 94 court suits from dioceses to individual church-affiliated organizations. These are plaintiffs, and Priest for Life is the fourth one that has filed a suit against the HHS mandate and the federal government on this. They're plaintiffs about the health insurance plan, which under the president's health care blueprint, Obamacare, includes contraceptives and abortifacients, plainly contrary to the teaching of the Catholic and Orthodox and other churches and which incidentally had been contrary to all mainstream denominations until 1930 when the Anglican Church unfortunately broke and others followed suit. Are we better off for this? Look around, and if so, what is the standard that assesses our families and marriages today as a positive betterment? That question itself aside, a clarion call should sound in the ears of all citizens 
that when this U.S. administration in effect forces adoption of insurance plans providing contraceptives and abortion producing drugs as medical coverage, the administrating is violating the sovereignty of religion. It's violating that healthy separation which allows church to safeguard its own moral teachings flowing from its belief and not a court's belief. The government does not define morality or belief, for even the state legal interpretation is subject to the morality God has planted in society. That is one reason why the decisions of a court are generally called opinions, open to further review, not divine right. The freedoms enshrined in the Bill of Rights start with religion, not just Sunday worship or a place of worship to be protected, but religion takes worship into the public square, as did the apostles after Pentecost, the courageous young men in the book of Daniel, and of course, everywhere else. Yes, Pentecost was celebrated not in an upper room, but in the streets, as Pope Francis is telling us to get out into the streets. And so the powerful explosion of the Holy Spirit was received, going, therefore, teach ye all nations. The Lord's last words, go the masses ended, to take what you got here in spiritual nourishment and build out there. Friends, join thousands of people in offering prayers for the court's positive rejection of the HHS mandate, which compels an insurance policy gravely interfering with church teaching since its origins and would force penalties in the range, practically speaking, of $100 a day for each employee. That adds up quite quickly. Priests for Life will have its hearing on May the 8th in the federal court in Washington, D.C., and many others that you can follow as well. Please pray for all of these court cases. In a longer range of things, we look back to the courage of the three men about to be thrown into raging fire, or the martyrs, not because of their valor for faith, we do so because when religion is ta attacked, when freedom of conscience is attacked by such mandates as in these cases now before the court, there is another point to be made. Rejection of religion breeds rejection of other rights. The communists under Lenin and Stalin and Mao and the Nazis under Hitler knew this very well. Silence the church and it's easier to reshape thinking to fit totalitarian designs. That's already being worked out little by little in the machinations of the Babylonian conquerors of ancient Israel. There may be people in our nation who could care less about religious freedom being chipped away, but they ought to be wary because other rights then will fall very easily, our speech and certainly our right to life, which is already encroached upon. For on what basis would the map of God's plan as our founding fathers got it ensure balance and justice were we to lose the anchoring of religion. The right to life is so basic that no other right can in fact flow from it if we're not given the right to live from the very outset of our existence in our mother's womb at conception. And yet abortion is widespread, getting nearly the 60 million mark since the genie was let out of the bottle in Roe v. Wade, and that's just in this country alone. Since if religious liberty is not protected, the very reason why we should not permit killing itself is weakened, inasmuch as the relation between God's plan and our living it out is gravely threatened by government intrusions. We cannot tolerate this. We need to nip the intrusion in the bud. We need to pray each day for a fair and just God-fearing decision, an opinion to be rendered in the courts. The oral arguments, as I mentioned, is May 8th for us, and many others will follow upon that. Pray, please. And pray for the courage to stand up and be counted, ourselves and others, to give others the encouragement, never to be afraid to witness to Jesus Christ under no other name can anyone be saved. Especially when the threats become more dire and the heat goes up beyond the comfort zone especially then we are called upon to be faithful. Like those three men together, we will not serve an alien God nor a government which disregards the God of truth and life, for under no other name can anyone be saved.
Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.